thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and I'd like to thank all the organizers. Uh, it, it's wonderful on a personal note for me to be back in Columbia where I was a master's student many years ago, too many years ago to actually mention. Um, and it's wonderful to see so many colleagues and, and friends that I've met over the years and some new ones I hope to meet here uh, during this conference. Let me, let me jump right into my paper, uh, which uh, I apologize for I will read in the interest of trying to keep on the right side of the timekeeper. Who is the timekeeper, by the way? I guess it's, uh, she's, she's walking, so, if <laughs> so I get a head start, so that's good. Okay, now we'll try to make this move. Yeah. The image of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, future Atatürk, as educator in chief, touring the countryside to teach the new Turkish alphabet was crucial to establishing the notion that the advent of modern education was synonymous with the change from the Ottoman Empire to the Turkish Republic. The young Republic took great pains to draw a series of contrasts between the purportedly outmoded imperial era and the putatively progressive nation state. Yet, like the, like the Republic itself, many of the educational advances of the Kemalist era were built on late Ottoman foundations. This paper attempts to situate the educational changes from empire to republic in the context of the ongoing expansion of public education. In particular, I focus here on the high profile nature of the Republican educational effort, its urgency, the contrasts, but also the continuities between the imperial and the Republican approaches, and briefly, the reception that met early Republican education. As is well known, the policies affected by the early Turkish Republic included numerous examples of dramatic change intended to draw a sharp line between its, with its imperial predecessor. Whether it was removing first the Sultan and then the Caliph, adopting the Julian calendar, replacing Friday as the weekly day of rest, thank you. Re reducing barriers to gender equality, banning the Fez in favor of the Grim Cat, replacing the Arabo-Persian script with the Latin, importing the Swiss Civil Code, or abolishing the Islamic institutions of higher learning and the Dervish lodges, Kemalist rule exhibited a flair for the dramatic. The changes enacted in the field of education played their part in symbolizing the break with Ottoman and Islamic tradition and the new orientation of the Republic. The Ankara government heralded educational change early and often, exhibiting its centrality to the Kemalist project. The flexibility of what might be included in the term education was clearly useful in this respect, whether understood broadly as a plan for modernizing society as a whole, or more specifically, as mediated through particular institutions, laws, or policies at specific changes that it felt needed to be implemented, education stood for the new state's sweeping approach towards remaking Anatolian society. Education, both generally conceived and institutionally concentrated, was a key area for the Turkish Republic to demonstrate its most cherished values. These included, among, other, among others, modernity, secularism, national unity, rationality, etc. On top of the more practical, if prosaic needs of a, of a, modernize, of a modernizing state, such as training, whether terbiye or talim, the words themselves indicators of the one-way direction that Republican education was meant to impart, future cadres for implementing the state-derived agenda, as well as nationally-minded citizens more broadly. Education thus dovetailed with and served as a stage for other high-profile dynamic projects of the Kemalist period, such as gender equality, sartorial change, the removal of religion from the public sphere, and their curtailing of foreign and minority influence. It also demonstrated forcefully that the Ankara government was the ultimate arbiter of Turkey's future, even if it wasn't always listening to that society, point to which we return below. Although broadly democratic in the sense of expanding social, economic, and political access and participation, Republican education was conceived and then implemented in a manner that bore the markings of its highly dirigist and statist revolutionism in Kilabchivik, as typified by the well-known phrase, for the people in spite of the people. 
Education bore considerable weight in the Kemalist project. This can be seen in the high profile given to, the, to educational matters, to the deployment of high ranking individuals in the educational cause and in the production of educational materials, as we'll see, and generally speaking, the high priority given to educational change. The notion that the new nation was essentially a large classroom and Mustafa Kemal, its headmaster or even its educator in chief, were both popular tropes in the early republic. The image of the Ghazi opening schools and in the wake of the alphabet change, touring the countryside with a blackboard and chalk, as we saw earlier, to teach the new way of writing became a staple of Republican iconography. This image is, is a particularly interesting one, curious one, we might say. Uh, perhaps the less said about the fashion statement made by the, the leader, the better. Uh, also, the fact that this was taken in 1938 in, uh, in Dersim, Kunjali, at the time of the uh, campaign assault on Dersim, uh, and the fact that Mr. Bekmal was accompanied by his adopted daughter, Sabiha Gucheng, who was actively involved uh, as a pilot in that campaign, is uh, worthy of note. Education uh, is clearly playing a role alongside a much other more serious concerns. These high level appearances were supplemented by the interventions of other leading figures associated with the regime. A range of individuals, including prominent figures from the middle, military, literary, and professional circles, lent their considerable prestige and intellectual reputations to the educational effort. Thus, modest children's textbooks from this period often bear the names of high, pro high profile contributors. One example of this group was Mehmet Quad Kripperdu, the writer literary scholar, and arguably the most prominent name in the field of Ottoman history at the time, at least among those who identified with the Kemalist project. A descendant of the famous family of grand viziers from the 17th century, Mehmed Fouad had become inspired by the populist trend in late Ottoman letters and advocated for historians to address the common people. He also shifted dramatically towards the brand of Turkish nationalism favored by the Ankara government. Consider this pa passage that he contributed to a children's reading primer published in 1926. Until recent times, the Turks were the slaves of the sultans. These sultans living in ornate august palaces, following their pleasure from morning to night and feeding thousands of retainers in their palaces, supposed themselves to be the personal owners of the country. Later in the same entry, the eminent Ottoman historian and scion of the prominent family, Ottoman, Ottoman family refers to the Ottoman sultans as, quote, blood-sucking oppressors. These and many other examples of demonization provide a sense of how ideologically driven the Republican education campaign could be. Below the highest echelon of figures engaged in the highly, in the highly ideological educational agenda was a less well-known, but in some respects, equally important group of, of writers and publishers. These were individuals engaged in writing most of the books that were deployed in the Republican classrooms and purchased on the open market. One example of this less well, less well known cadre was an individual named Ahmed Javad, later Ahmed Javad Emre. Like Kirkerle, he was a scholar of Turkic languages and was the first to occupy the chair of oral Altaic languages in the Ottoman University, the Dalatunun, succeeding the inaugural holder, Friedrich Giza. Meanwhile, perhaps to augment his income, Ahmed Javad wrote several children's texts on morals, ahlak, and how to read the Quran. During a stint in Russia, where he can be seen on the left, looking like he fits in very well in the Leninist period, uh, he apparently shared an apartment and also apparently an experimental family living arrangement with Nazim Hikmet and Bala Nureddin, because he was the junior member of this uh, troika, he uh, was the one responsible for all the cooking. But he apparently later, uh, soon thereafter, ran afoul of the Soviets and returned to Turkey. Of course, when he left it, it had been the Ottoman Empire, where his articles in the journal Aydın Lut caught the attention of Mustafa Kemal. His work on language and his translations of Aeschylus and Homer must have appealed to the future Ataturk because Ahmed Javad was soon appointed to the language uh, council, Dilheyeti. And here's a picture of a somewhat claustrophobic looking meeting of the first meeting of the Dilheyeti in Dolmapache Palace. 
uh, which was, of course, tasked with uh, language reform. Ahmed Javad seemingly became a quick adherent of Kemalism uh, and may have been the first to use that term in print. Ahmed Javad's 1929 children's text entitled A Turkish Reader for Republican Children left little doubt about the completeness of his conversion from Ottomanism to Kemalism. For example, a skit called Long Live the Republic depicts a student, a group of students, a group of children, sorry, at play in a park. The bossy Osman, the names are important here, orders the children to come to him. He is opposed, opposed by the brave Turhan, who challenges Osman's authority and asks Osman what he wants from us. Osman, clearly a stand-in for the deposed sultan, demands all the children's toys. You will give me all your balls and all your tops. Turhan confronts him again, stating, lest any reader fail to see the parallel, you are like the evil Padishah who robs the nation. That day is gone, my dear. When Osman insists that the children do what he says, Turhan organizes them in resistance, urging them to arm themselves with whatever is at hand and promising to put the would-be Padishah in his place. Osman eventually retreats in fear and Turhan urges his playmates turned guerrilla fighters to chant, down with the Padishah, long live the Republic. Here's the, here's the text as it appears. On the next page uh, appears a portrait of Mustafa Kemal, reinforced by the caption, his name is Mustafa Kemal, the great Ghazi. It is he who protected us from destruction. Again, lest anything be left to chance, a text entitled, Our Dear President of the Republic identifies him as the one who saved us from evil and the sultan as the one who wanted to take away the children's toys, but the God he prevailed. Further reinforcement is supplied by a list of guided questions. What kind of child is Osman who wanted to take away the other children's toys? Did the sultans resemble Osman? What kind of child is Turhan who united the friends against Osman? Do you prefer Osman or Turhan? Finally, a text for dictation. The sultans robbed the nation. Mustafa Kemal Pasha united the nation, defeated the Padishah's army, and created the Republic. Uh, the re reference to uh, Mustafa Kemal. Ironically, Ahmed Javad had only recently encouraged his young readers to revere and obey Sultan Rashad and to love him like a father. A picture of that from a slightly earlier text. Clearly didactic, possibly overbearing, Texts such as these underscore how the Ottoman to Republican shift in the educational field relied on clear contrasts, but how quickly also the subject matter could change. The urgency with which the early Turkish Republic set about to change the educational scene is reflected in the first major piece of legislation in the field and one of the very first and most comprehensive laws enacted by the new Ankara government. The Unity of Education Law, Tefidi Tedbisat Kanunu, of 3 March 1924, placed all educational institutions in the country under the jurisdiction of the education ministry, outlawed the local Quran schools, and placed foreign and minority schools under the control of the education ministry, and decreed that all WAKF funds, WAKF funds be transferred to the education ministry and ostensibly barred all education from having a religious or a political content, at least not an oppositional one. The early attention to education indicates not only its priority in the Kemalist agenda, but also the pent up frustrations of state educational officials with the obstacles that have prevented total state control over education in the Ottoman period. At a time when, given the demographic, social, and economic devastation wrought by the preceding decade plus period of, of near constant warfare and deprivation, one might have expected other needs to have been more pressing, but education was remarkably high on the list. In fact, even while the national struggle was raging, Mustafa Kemal and his fellow nationalists were engaged in educational matters. So vital was the issue of education for the future leaders of the Republic. An important agenda implicit in the new law was its anti-minority and anti-foreign dimension, which was the flip side of the emerging Turkification policy. It has to be seen together with such policies as the Law on State Employees, 1926, which barred non-Muslim citizens from being hired from, for government positions, and the Citizens Speak Turkish campaign of the late 1930s, which had a chilling effect on minorities, even as it tacitly acknowledged the problem inherent in the drives for Turkification and national unity. 
Another salient dimension of early Turkish education policy was its utility in generating the narrative of the new Turkey for foreign correspondence, foreign consumption. It's clear from numerous interviews that Mustafa, Mustafa Kemal gave to Western journalists and statesmen, and from the publications produced in European languages, that education was a key selling point abroad. Western audiences lapped up the flattering westernizing angle, and the subject of the new Turkey was often in vogue in Western countries during this period. Western journalists and commentators frequently overlooked the darker aspects of the new regime policies, such as its dictatorial tendencies, its anti-foreign and anti-minority elements, and the stridency of its nationalism. One place where these were not only ignored, not only not ignored, but eagerly absorbed, however, was Weimar Germany. As Stefan Erich's work has shown, the right-wing German press and growing political movement associated with it latched onto Kemalism and Mustafa Kemal uh, as the model of a Fuhrer to be emulated, and several provisions of early Republican legislation, such as the stress on national unity, and the Young Republic's anti-minority provisions with the direst of future consequences. Turning now to the means by which the early Republic attempted to, to deliver its domestic educational message, we note that it relied on a series of basic contrasts intended to emphasize the distance between its policies and those of the old regime. Having seen a few examples as expressed by uh, Mehmet Fouad Kripperle and Ahmed Javad Emre, we can summarize the main contrasts as follows. Above all, the Republic claims itself and naturally its educational provision as new and modern and in marked contrast with the old, lead outmoded style. It's a pretty rough image, I'm afraid, but it gives you the contrast between the way the Ankara government wanted people to see the old style of education as opposed to the new style of education. It presented itself as a vehicle for progress and enlightenment as opposed to the purportedly backward and benighted approach of the empire. Crucial here, obviously, was the key concept of secularism, even if that term does not fully capture the radical nature of the laicism inherent in the Kemalist approach. A useful foil for the Republican approach was the denigration of the symbol of the old style religious schooling, the lowly hoja. He was frequently involved in a, as a frightful reminder of all that was supposedly wrong with the old education poorly educated, slovenly, greedy, venal, and most alarming, we can assume for young readers, violent. The old style teacher was a subject of multiple publications, usually illustrated with a stick in hand. He was frequently linked with the bastinado, palaka, the device that allowed him unfettered access to punish the souls of his students' feet. The contrast with the new schools, although they often used the foreign uh, illustrations to, to point it. And note also the uh, orthographic uh, problems with the, uh, the typesetters of the early Republic uh, had, to, had to face. Um, and interest obsession with the sort of new style teacher, but again, the, uh, the illustrations are often in this period borrowed from, from Western sources. But the, the new teachers and, and the contrast between the new schools and the old schools were a steady theme of the early Republican image making. Even as I said, if those, any of those images were borrowed from the West. So far, so straightforward. The only problem with this picture is the fact that many of these same tropes, images and texts have been produced in the late Ottoman era by late Ottoman modernizers. Whether we look at the state schools, their architectural layout, their focus on mainly secular topics, their texts, and even their teachers, we find that the Republican educational provision was building on a tradition that was well underway in the late 19th and early 20th century. In fact, many of the contrasts invoked by Republican educators and their agents have been routinely deployed in the late Ottoman period. The main differences lay in the fact that late Ottoman educational reform was effected alongside and therefore not in outright opposition to the schools of the, the religious establishment. The biggest change the Republic wrought was in sweeping away, at least again on paper, the right of those, the right of those uh, traditional schools to exist. The Republic's ostensibly novel schools owed more than a little to their late Ottoman antecedents. Given the lead time and the financial resources required, most of their buildings were either repurposed Ottoman state schools. Uh, here's a secondary school from the 1880s. Um, 
Ismit, uh, board designed in a similar style, 1931 uh, building uh, designed by the architect Kemal Etinbe. Most of their teachers were retained from the previous regime and many Ottoman era texts continued to be taught. When the texts used in the classroom were quote unquote republicanized, following a trend to alter the curriculum in each of the successive periods of the transition from late empire to republic, the results were often remarkably superficial. For example, illustrations were refashioned so as to change the clothing of the characters and depicted, as you can see here. Um, the actions they are performing remain the same, as do the accompanying texts uh, of the stories themselves, which were produced absolutely verbatim. Many of the key concepts delivered in those texts were recycled from late Ottoman times. Key areas of continuity included the notion that the nation, replacing the empire, obviously, was more important than the family, as both governments attempted to forge a direct relationship with their young students, um, proto-citizens. In both periods, the family was deemed suspect and essentially an impediment to the modernizing agenda. Likewise, both educational provisions focused on training obedient and patriotic citizens who could be counted on to love and to serve the country. To this end, both the Ottoman and Republican eras focused heavily on geographical education, aiming to instill a strong bond between their charges and their territory, and by implication, the governing political structure, whether it was the empire or the nation state. Often criticized as heavy handed in this pursuit, it has to be said that the early Republic was successful in imparting a very clear vision of what it considered Turkey to be and how its subjects should relate to it. Much less is known about the reception of Kemalist education. The historiography has tended to buy into the state-centered approach. Recent research has added to what little we know of the decidedly mixed reception it received, especially away from the larger cities. While many in the towns appear to have welcomed or at least accepted the new schools, the countryside proved an altogether different response, provided an altogether different response. Their apathy, opting out, and at times even outright resistance to the new educational provision were recorded. For example, when discussing the people's houses and later the people's rooms, Kemal Karpat noted 60 years ago that their strong association with the government and the ruling party and the reliance on what he termed rigid government control quote, deepened the gap between government and people, something which the houses were originally intended to eliminate. Recent research, particularly that of Murat Metinsoy, has underscored popular suspicion of and aversion to the new schools and the changes they represented. Not surprisingly, therefore, in many provinces, literacy and school attendance actually declined in the 1920s and 1930s, with some provinces not recovering until the 1940s. A substantial problem for Republican educational officials was the perception that they and their agents on the ground were viewed by the local population with deep suspicion. Seen as outsiders, the state's representatives were potentially threatening. Teachers were particularly suspect for several reasons. Many saw them simply as agents of godlessness and impiety. Villages often wanted to know who was going to teach religion in the new curriculum, and occasionally threatening teachers for ignoring the Quran and religious education. The curriculum and the text underpinning it must have seemed especially alien given the prominence given to foreign classics. An official publication from the Ministry of Education lists the extensive publication list of translations being prepared in the 1940s, ranging from the Babylonian, the Chinese, Indian, and Greek classics to the more numerous works drawn from European literature, predominantly French, English, German, and Russian titles. And the alien nature of some of the skills being imparted even in areas such as agriculture and animal husbandry. Furthermore, against the backdrop of the serious economic downturn of the period, locals were highly aware that compulsory education deprived rural families of an important source of labor. Worse still, despite their frequently good intentions and reforming zeal, teachers as representatives of the state were not helped by the fact that in some cases, they were meant to double up as tax collectors, census takers, or agents of military conscription. The people's houses in the provincial centers and people's rooms in the villages, about which Aisha Bura and Rashad Kasaba will be saying more in their papers tomorrow, were seen as, quote, sites of indoctrination and socialization, but not in a good way. Here's a more positive image of socialization and indoctrination 
where a, a young child teaches her dolls and stuffed animals Turkish while the stern visage of Mustafa Kemal uh, looks on. That's the way things perhaps should have been proceeding in the countryside, but the reactions of locals suggest that it's not the case. The Anatolian locals fought back with rumor, apathy, and distrust. Rumors reinforced the perception that the regime and its elites were seen as impious, godless, debauched outsiders bent on destroying the long-standing religio-cultural fabric of society. It is worth remembering that not many years had passed since the national struggle period, when many in Anatolia referred dismissively to the Unionists as essentially alien Balkan figures who were suspect in local eyes. This clash of perspectives is per perhaps not particularly surprising, given both the locals' inherent suspicion of outsiders and the regime's innate and supreme confidence that it uniquely had the correct plan for the country. Despite populism, called Jaluk, being a key principle in the Kemalist project, their elitist mentality carried little provision for popular input. Thus, when in the early Republic, perhaps inevitably, rumblings of discontent and resistance appeared, their reaction was typically to choose suppression, censorship, and internal spying instead of co-optation or rethinking the agenda. And therefore, another irony, not unlike the Hamidian state's response to union opposition in the first place. Although at times they were forced to abandon some of the most unpopular measures. Eventually, as we know, the harsher aspects of Kemalist educational policies yielded to an approach that was more in line with popular approaches, to the role of religion in society. When the party took the decision to end the euphemistic single party era, the result was more or less inevitable. A brief conclusion. For all the vehemence of the attempt to separate the early republic from its imperial predecessor, there was naturally much in common, as we have seen from only a cursory look in the field of education. Like its fellow post-Ottoman states, the Republic of Turkey tended to overemphasize over the contrast with its predecessor. In some respects, this was more nearly justified in the field of education, where the Republic went beyond the late Ottoman's initiative uh, to reduce society's reliance on communal, i.e. religiously organized, Millet education and other functions. The Kemalist, state, the Kemalist state went all in on a much more radical approach, one that appealed to many outsiders who were wary of and sometimes downright antagonistic toward the country's Islamic traditions. Its sharp term, turn away from preceding developments in education, which, although not always coherent, were probably striving for some sort of synthesis between what numerous educationalists of the late 19th century referred to as the demands of the present and the prevailing religio-cultural traditions. For many, the Republican turn was undoubtedly too abrupt. The Kemalist approach emphasized breaks when it could have chosen to accentuate the continuities with recent Ottoman educational tradition. There, were perhaps, there was perhaps something about the fragility, what Yael Navarro Yashin has referred to as the flimsiness of the Republic's modernizing project that did not allow it to acknowledge its antecedents in the old regime. This set up a jarring, un unintended contrast with the status quo from which many recoiled. Despite its considerable successes in education, the early Republican rush to implement the new and to many the alien eventually resulted in a step backward and an uneven trajectory. The correction that started in the run-up to the end of the single party regime in the 1940s would search for a more balanced approach, one that aligned the people's experience of religion and empire with a newfound focus on national identity. The result, of course, was the Turco-Islamic synthesis, one that argu was arguably, if ironically, assisted by the radical swerve of early Kemalism. The Turco-Islamic synthesis brought with it problems of its own, but that is another story. Thank you.